We're very privileged to be in the presence of, of three writers um, who are some of my favorite writers and, I, and, I, and may already be yours, but soon will be if not. Um, I'm gonna be moderating a conversation um, and as I, as I told our participants, um, I'm, I'm hopeful that this can be as much of a, a conversation between the three of them and, and it, kind of an organic thing. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk for a while and then maybe kind of move into questions. Um, so without further ado, let me, let me introduce our speakers. You, you probably already know, but um, on, the, on the far end, we have Sarah Ladipo Manjika, um, author of Independence, and most recently, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun. Um, I was reading uh, Independence has become a, a set text in Nigeria recently, which is, which is an exciting thing. Um, and we are now privileged, this came out in the UK last year, and we're now privileged to have it in the United States, thanks to uh, Cassava Republic Press, a Nigerian press is now, um, is, I, I work at Diesel Bookstore in Oakland, and I can now sell books from Cassava Republic Press, which is a wonderful thing, so we can sell this book, finally. Um, in the middle, uh, we have Leslie Nika Arima, um, who's what it means when a man falls from the sky has been blowing people's minds for uh, a few months now and, and will continue to do so. Um, she's someone, this, this is, it's a marvelous collection of, we've been reading her for a while. You know, she, was, she was shortlisted for the Kane Prize last year and is shortlisted for the Kane Prize this year. And it's, there's something very exciting about reading her short stories one after the other and the, the succession of them and the way short stories that have been published in the New Yorker in a variety of places, um, to, to see them collected and to see it, it, it all come out as one book, it, it does something magnificent. Um, and then on, on the farthest end, we have um, uh, Jennifer Nansabuga Mukumbi, who comes to us uh, from Manchester. We're, we're, very, we're, 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 we're very privileged to have her in the United States. Um, her, her first novel, Chintu, has, has taken a long time to get to, uh, to, get to us, um, and it's, it's wonderful to have it here. I, I feel like I've said so many things about this book that I don't have any more superlatives left. Um, <laughs> but I want to I, I wanna thank them all for being here, and I want to particularly thank Transit Books, um, who is sponsoring this panel um, and who, who published uh, Chintu uh, a, f a few weeks ago. Um, so just to get... To get us started, um, I wonder um, if we could just off the bat. This is a this is a panel. This is called Writing from Africa, and in some ways, I feel like it's this is it's a, it's a statement that's obviously true in some senses, but in in a different sense for each writer. And and in some ways, it's the least specific way of, of talking about them and, and how their work operates and how their work functions. Um, and so I, I wonder if I could just sort of present to our speakers um, that as a kind of provocation. If you could talk about what what it what it does to your writing to have the word have 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 Africa as kind of constantly the passport it carries around, especially in these spaces. Um, we, would you like to start, Jennifer? Um, yes. You know, for a long time, writing from Nigeria. That it has represented Africa. So when okay, sorry. Uh, for a long time, um, African writing has been mostly synonymous with Nigerian writing. So when you thought of African writing, you thought of Chinua Achebe, Wale Shoinka, and all the big names apart from Ngoji, who's from East Africa, where I'm from. But, uh, 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 and for a long time, because there wasn't a lot of writing coming out of Africa, everybody who wrote, regardless where they came from within Africa, it was just considered African literature. But at the moment, there's such a blowout of writing coming out of Africa that even avid readers like me who have decided now just to concentrate on writing coming out of Africa, you can't keep up. And therefore, the word Africa does not start to um, describe African writing or writing coming out of Africa. So now we have Nigerian writing, you know, we have Ugandan writing, and we have Kenyan writing. So readers now, especially in the West, must keep up 
and realize that Africa is far wider than Nigeria. <laughs> In my defense, or in our defense, well, I, I will. Say, it always comes up that the Nigerians, or you know, everywhere, and, and we, we are. But I mean, like one, I think it's like one out of every five black people on the planet is Nigerian. Which is it's a numbers thing. It's math, right? So, <laughs> um, and I would have to agree with um, with what Jennifer said uh, that the current landscape of African literature is so so rich and so varied that. Um, that you know the moniker African literature, uh, you know, it's is one of many descriptions, right? And one of many, well, you know, the giant category under which we shelf Nigerian literature, yeah. Ghanaian literature, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think um, you, know, the, you know the sort of African literature question, uh, when it when it when it's come up, it's always come up as though um, is this is this a label that you reject or or are you more than just african you know, it's like it's, you know <laughs> this, this idea that it's it's supposed to be a limiting category and it's only limiting if you it's, i think it's, it's only a limiting category for people who uh, have a narrow idea or understanding of what african is um, and so and i think that i think that you know it's it's there's always the you know the assumption of a western audience and so um, and so the, well, I think that, you know, for most for most Westerners, when the you know African as a descriptor comes up, there's an image that comes with it, right? And um, and so it's limiting because people have that image, but the moniker itself is not a limiting um, it's not a limiting category. And, and you know and you know whenever the these African literature discussions would come up um, about oh well is this African literature is this not African literature etc cetera, etc cetera, I always say. I, I, I wait, I'm waiting for the day where, when there's just so much of our work out there that it's a stupid question to ask. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. This is just such a lovely group to look out onto, and I'm going to lift this up because otherwise I won't be close enough. Um, and it's such a privilege for me to be with Jennifer and Leslie, great writers that I've been admiring over the last couple of years. And uh, just to add to what they were saying, you know, uh, we're all Africans. We all come from Africa. So um, let's, just, let's just get that out of the way right away. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting, as Aaron was introducing us, and Aaron talked about Jennifer from Manchester. And, you know, we, we all have been privileged to live in different parts of the world. So Africa is also Africans living in Manchester, in Minneapolis, I think. That's where you're from. Um, here in San Francisco. And our story speaks to, you know, in different ways to different parts of the world as well. And so I think that's really important uh, to recognize. And, you know, Jennifer, I know you're feeling outnumbered and Laleo, but, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I have to say, when I first read Jennifer's book, I was blown away by the voice of her novel. And I thought, this is Things Fall Apart, rewritten from a feminist perspective, it's awesome. So, um, you know, no disrespect to my uh, countryman, Chinua Achebe, uh, great, great writer, but uh, he's got a little competition. Yes. Ah. <laughs> Thank you. I think I, I am in good, you know, company now. I don't feel overwhelmed <laughs> like we normally are. <laughs> And I, I wanted to build on that. I am confused. It's a phenomenal book. And um, you mentioned yesterday uh, in a, a conversation we had that you wrote it for 10 years in secret. Yeah. And so I wanted, you know, and you know, that, that you know, there's something very um, appealing of, you know, having the secret thing that you're working on and, you know, and like the day that you're going to pre present it fully formed, right, to like when people find out about it. Yeah. And so I was, I was curious about how writing has changed for you now that it's out there and every, everyone that you know knows that you write and so like there's none of that secrecy anymore. Exactly. How has that affected like, your, your writing? Um, what um, Leslie is referring to is that I left Uganda and I told my family, I'm going to study African literature and my mother asked, oh, so when you come back, what, what, what will that study do to you? And I said, I'll become a headmistress of the, uh, the school where I was teaching, but actually I had come to study creative writing. You just don't tell your African relatives that you're going to spend 7,200 pounds on creative writing. <laughs> you, 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 you don't do that. 
<laughs> so fortunately, when I finished the book, I was lucky enough to win the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, and the Commonwealth decided to take it back to Uganda to announce it. So my family collected my mother, my sisters, and then they announced the winner, Jennifer McCullin. They were like, she's been writing? <laughs> Have you been writing? Is that what you've been up to? <laughs> Because at one point, my sister wrote to me and said, you know, Jennifer, that degree you're doing, if you had had a child, you know, she, he would be like five years old now. <laughs> but that's what Leslie is referring to. But since it came out now, um, my family is so proud. Uh, you know, they, when my mother introduces me, she said, she's the writer one. <laughs> and uh, in a way, after Chintu came out in Uganda, because uh, there were, it was, Ugandans were so surprised. They had never seen their country, their language, their landscape in a book that is regarded internationally. And I would see, I would come across people saying, oh my God, you were writing about my family. All the names you used in that book. Um, or someone would say, I grew up in this place and in that place. And oh my God, how did you know? It was wonderful to have that kind of conversation with people. But the problem with that is that now, everywhere I go, where's the second book? Right. Where, where, where you promised us a second book. So it, I, I'm reluctant to go back to Uganda until I publish my second <laughs> book. Um, can I push that question to you? And I, because I'm, I'm curious, and this is, I, I've been reading Leslie's short stories for a while, just in bits and pieces, and and it's a very different experience to read an entire book. And there is a way in which book, you know, having a book is different than having. I mean, a, a short story in the New Yorker is wonderful. The Kane Prize is wonderful, but there's something different about having a book. And I, I wonder if you could talk about that, you know, how how that has changed having this out. Um, yes, yeah, so, you know, and you know, when uh, you know the individual stories and the book, I think what the book allowed me to do was to um, sort of you know, have this document that reflects my aesthetic, right? And so you know, my, my short stories can be about very different things, but all of those different things happening in, in the one book is, you know, it's a good reflection of my, um, my sort of creative life. But um, the book coming out, I mean, it's been, it's been wonderful. I have, I have, ter I have terrible short-term memory. Um, and I'll just, you know, I'll forget, I'll forget names right away and like things like that. And so sometimes I just sort of like forget that this thing is happening. And it's easy, <laughs> right, and it's easy, and it's easy to do because, I mean, I still have to take my trash out. I still have to do my dishes. Like it's easy to like to forget that this thing is happening until, you know, until you come to events like this yeah. or, you know, I get on Twitter or things like that. But yeah, it's just, you know, it's been, um, it's been really interesting for me how it's been received. Um, and you know, I uh, I get questions a lot about oh who's 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 the audience for this who did who you know and I I always I write I write for a Nigerian audience um, in the sense that I don't uh, I don't like I, I, my work needs to offer like my work offer must offer something to Nigerians and to people who have the same knowledge of the world as I do. And so, um, and so I didn't want to write uh, literature that was sort of, you know, explaining or being like PR for Nigeria. I was just like, no, like I, I'm just going to write the stories, and um, and uh, and I think that that uh, and so like seeing having it um, it be well received uh, by uh, other Nigerians has been um, very very gratifying. So. Um, it's a. Another way to, to gloss, I think Jennifer says that this is kind of an explosion of, of African writing right now, um, has has been this this sense that, I, I mean, I, I feel like it's it's more possible. I think the publishing industry in the United States, for example, is is much more open to um, to writers who are really writing for African audiences first, and 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 having a sense that you know these books. Um, are books that you, you know you have to come to where the book lives mm -hmm. as a as an American audience or whatever, um, and I and I wonder um, if if you could talk a little. I mean, this is this is a this is a question I want. I, I'll, I'll, I'll I'll pass it to Sarah, but but I, I, I would like it. I would like you all to, to to maybe engage with it. 
it, the, the sense in which um, different audiences come to your book in different ways and, and what kinds of, I, I mean, there's different ways to frame that. There's, there's saying, you know, these people read it this way, these people read it this way, or, or there's different audiences bring the book to life in different ways, um, or the book brings different audiences together, you know, in teaching them how to read it. And I, I wonder, because all of you have audiences in very different places who bring very different sets of kind of readerly expectations, resources as readers, just knowledge of, and different ways of, I'm thinking of um, Leslie's story, there's, there's a story uh, a, about a volcano that I, I think, I mean, it's a marvelous story and I won't spoil it, but there's a way in which it, it becomes, by the end, you suddenly realize what kind of a story you're reading and, it, and depending on what you think about that frame, what you think about what that genre of story is, you're, you're, you're gonna read it in different ways. Um, and so, I've said enough. Um, <laughs> what can you do with that, that mess of a question, Sarah? <laughs> I might just ignore it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's such, there's so much, so much to say. No, I won't, of course I won't ignore it. Um, uh, audience, you know, I'll say a couple things. You know, it's interesting when we think of writing from Africa, I think stereotypically in the past, um, and even arguably still today, when people think of African writers, they'll think probably of Chinua Achebe and possibly uh, Chimamanda Adichie right now. Um, even though, as we've been saying, there's just been this amazing, uh, uh, what looks like a renaissance, a flourishing of so many writers um, from Africa and when, within the African diaspora. Um, certainly in the 1960s, the names that would have been recognizable were mainly men, and so it's really exciting to see that now a lot of the names are women, and uh, so you have three of us here, um, and we're all, we're all, I was thinking this this morning, we're all writing with this particular book that we're talking about different you know, genres that you wouldn't necessarily think of as sort of, again, stereotypical. It's not the 300-page novel that comes, or the 190-page novel that comes from Chinua Achebe or Ngugi or Shoinka or so forth. Um, Jennifer's written this amazing, epic, big book, and Leslie's written these wonderful short stories, a collection of short stories, and I've written a short novel, also known as a novella. So there, already, you have something that's quite different from what you would have thought of in the past. Um, in terms of thinking about audience myself, um, I've always been really fascinated by Toni Morrison who writes to, for, and about African Americans. Mm -hmm. And um, I had the un incredible experience of interviewing her last month, so she's really still in my mind a lot. Um, and I think when I write, I, you know, I'm writing stories that I want to read that I haven't been able to find. And, um, you know, so Jennifer and Leslie's work are those kind of stories that I want to read. So when I write, that's the audience that I write for. Um, and that can be a Nigerian, it can be someone in Taiwan, it can, I don't know, you know? Um, and so, so when I write, that's how I think about my audience. But, you know, I'll just say one more thing about audience, which has just been absolutely incredible for me. And, and you know, Aaron made reference to this. My first novel, um, Independence was recently made the text that all, in, in Nigeria, if you apply to universities, there's always one text that is read by everyone to test their proficiency in English. And up until now, it's all been written, all the books that have been used have been by men. So again, this is exciting. And um, they chose my book this year. Um, and Nigeria is a big country, as Jennifer knows. So um, close to 200 million people, which means that there are about 2 million students. So I'm in the position of having 2 million students read my book. and. One of the things that's been so amazing and wonderful and humbling for me is to have students write to me and say, oh, you know, uh, Fiditi was in your book, or Ken Sarawi was in your book, or, you know, Kana was in your book, and, you know, I've never read anything with my hometown or my heroes in, in a book. And, I mean, just for me, of course, I'm also getting people saying, you know, your book is too long. Where is the shortcut? Uh, people <laughs> say, you know, your book really sucks. You know, <laughs> you know? and then I was thinking about you, Jennifer, you know, may God curse you for writing this book. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, maybe I'm on, under a curse as well. But, you know, uh, so, you know, I, two, two billion people, you're going to get a lot of uh, feedback. But, um, but that, you know, just that seeing the joy that people have to see themselves reflected in, <clears throat> in the work. 
Well, my voice is going, so that's time for me to stop. <laughs> I've forgotten the question. I, <laughs> um, audience, right. Well, I mean, I think, um, I think that yes, I think the different audience do bring like, it brings a different different perspective and um, to to the work and uh, I think that you know it's not something that is helpful for me to think about when I'm writing, right? Like all I feel like all of those things are are things that like other people will bring up, right? Um, and and so uh, I I don't actively I don't, I don't think about those things when I'm writing, but I mean you know once once the writing once the, uh, your writing is out in the world, you don't you have no control over. You know the way it's interpreted. It's 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 its own baby doing its own thing, um, and so I, you know I think that um, I think that uh, I feel like the, the current sort of average uh, Western reader um, in the United States um, has I think that uh, because of this you know. Uh, this you know, visible renaissance of, of African literature, I feel like we've sort of we're, we're trained, like we're, we've slowly trained you to <laughs> to be a slightly you know to be better readers, um, or you know you know fingers crossed, but um, but I think I mean that it's not you know I, I still we you still see I think um, the effects of or not the effects of the the different reactions to different pieces of work that 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 you know that that an African writer puts out. I don't think it's something we can. I don't know. It's like I feel like I, I, if I can't have any control over it, I can't. Like I, there's only so much I can worry about it because it's gonna. I mean, it's gonna drive you crazy, and it's it's not something that I can take to like the table, um, uh, or take you know, to the computer to um, and flesh out in the work. Like I can't. Uh, like I just physically can't write with like the voice, like That's too many it. voices in the background. So um, so it's sort of one of those questions where, like, where it's just like, oh, yeah, it's interesting to like let other people debate about it. And just, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. no, yeah. I, ju I just want to add one more thing about audience, um, which is I think audience doesn't just necessarily happen. Right. So um, Transit Books has done a great thing in Transit Books and in uh, bringing Jennifer here. Aaron, you have done great things in writing reviews. There are people here from the Museum of the African Diaspora who have raised voices up. You know, you know, I think Africans in the diaspora are more and more beginning to read works written by African authors and so forth. So it doesn't just happen, mm -hmm. uh, nor, uh, and, and I wish I had the confidence that we, we have trained people to read, but I think there are, all these other, there are all these other actors and players out there who actually help to facilitate this. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important to underscore that as well. Um, I am quite militant about audience. Mm -hmm. Oh, I am, and I know who I'm writing for, and I write in a particular way. Now, uh, for those of you who uh, have been following the trends in African literature, you remember in the 50s, 60s, we had Heinemann's uh, African Writers series they were being edited by Chinua Achebe. Maybe you're not yet born at the time. But the, these are books that were, we had um, a publisher in South Africa that catered for Southern Africa, Anglophone Southern Africa. And then you had one in East Africa and you had one in West Africa. So those books were in, engaged with African readers directly. Yeah. But then in the 70s, when the continent was going through the hardest times politically, the, the Heinemann folded that up. And what happened was that most of African writers who are not being persecuted in their countries flew up to, and came to the West. Mm -hmm. And when they wrote, the publishers here edited and prepared their writing for Western audiences, mm -hmm. like here. So the language, the themes, everything that you would relate to. And I think this is the way, in a way, African literature has spoiled Western readers. Mm -hmm. So we had glossaries, we had explanations, and you know, we, we, but yeah. what that did was that the African reader disengaged. And it was like, okay, yeah. so you're writing for the Western reader, so you don't care about us. And they totally disengaged with African yeah, literature. There was, there was like, there's, there's nothing here for me. Yeah. yeah. So, but now there's a turn. Mm -hmm. One, because of the ebook, 
So the books could be published here, but they get to the African reader quite quickly. And the bloggers, and they are not very happy with what we are writing, and they will tell you, you know. <laughs> and um, the, their fairs are like this now, and their book fairs. In fact, people like Adichie, when she's going to publish her book out here, it goes to Nigeria first. And at the moment, we are all African writers. People will tell you that, you know what? Sell your American rights and sell your British rights, but don't give the British, you know, all the Commonwealth rights. Keep your African rights. Because right now, we're getting aware that Africans are buying a lot of African books. And that has changed the way we write. Because they're going to ask you, so why are you explaining this? What makes you think I don't understand what you're saying? Exactly. You know? <laughs> It, it, this is changing. And for me, you know, I wrote against this. I wrote against explaining myself mm -hmm. to the West. Because by God, I grew up reading uh, uh, Shakespeare at the, at the equator. And you're talking about the, the winter of our discontent. Mm -hmm. And if I could do it yes. in Africa, oh, so you can do it. <laughs> you know, so I'm not going to... Uh, try to explain to the Western audience. Mm -hmm. And this, this has made my writing quite different. Because it's like, you know, when you fine-tune your lens and mm -hmm. focus, you know, it's like the Western reader is out of the picture and I'm conversing with the Ugandan. And the things we say to each other, the language we use, we don't perform for the West because we know some of the subjects you love. That is out of the way, and that makes a difference. And for me, you know, it's like, not that I'm saying that my book is like Mona Lisa, but you remember that picture, <laughs> the Mona Lisa? Yeah? He drew it with this woman looking at him, just him. But when he stepped out of the way, and 400 years later, I stepped in front of the Mona Lisa, and she's looking at me. And I think that's what literature does. I can focus on a Ugandan reader. Mm -hmm. But when you, an American, comes, come to my text, you will see yourself. You will see uh, the book talking directly at you. So I don't have to enga engage yeah. with you. I'll engage with a Ugandan, but you will find your way. I think the other thing that I want to say, just to add to what Jennifer says, is there are now African publishers that will, you can give your world rights to them and they bring it here. And this is what I've done with Cassava Republic Press. So this was really exciting for me. This is um, the press that comes out of Nigeria. And they've just set up offices in London and they're now distributing their books here. Um, and so I always said after I wrote my first book, if I was able to, I would give world rights to an African publisher. Um, and I could talk about this for a long time, but I'll just, you know, just even the book cover um, is fresh and new. I love all the book covers we have right now, but historically, if you look at book covers, you would see baobab trees, sunsets, and so forth. Um, and so giraffe. For me, uh, giraffe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> zebra, <laughs> Serengeti, you know, you, we, can, we can go on. Um, and so that, in, as well, is really exciting. It's a, re it's a new thing, um, something to watch. Um, yeah, ca can I say something about uh, these two books? Um, I, luckily, I, I started reading this book when I arrived. I'm so glad, because I have got the whole noise and background information of San Francisco. And I'm reading this book, and I cannot believe how, you know, you have a a Nigerian woman, woman who's a professor, was a professor, is in 75 years old, and has a sports car. But there's a way that African literature now has moved beyond just the continent. Mm -hmm. That, you know, African identities are numerous, and they are fluid, you know. So there's no pool or reference back a lot to Africa. But, you know, this is a Nigerian woman in her right, in San Francisco. And it, it, it's such a fantastic book, but also it helps readers back in Africa to come to terms with the diaspora, with diasporic writing, or the African in the diaspora. And it's the same with your book. Again, I, I started reading it when I arrived here. Um, the, here you have stories that are based in 
America, but also you have books, the stories that are best in Nigeria. And they are put together, you know, without explanation, without um, uh, apology, you know, because now the African reader also, not only just the Western reader, but the African reader is now also being challenged at understanding what Africa is, that Africa is beyond, goes beyond the continent. Um, I, I wonder if, um, I would like to ask uh, some questions about craft and some questions about how, um, how you, what, what, it's, it's, it's our, it's our, um, it's the richness of, of these books that it's very hard to summarize. It's very hard to generalize and to say something about all three that, that, that takes them all in. And that, that is a, I think there was a, you know, when Jennifer was talking about the Heinemann series, there was a, there was a kind of Heinemann style. You know, there, there was, there, there were, there were form genres. There were, there was a sense of, if you had read one, you would read the next one and you would, you know, you'd be like, yeah, this is, you know, 50% familiar. Um, that, that's not something you can say about these three books, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. It's also, it also speaks to, I think that there's a way in which um, the, the discourse around African literature is often about, like, how are you writing to your own community? And, 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 it, and it melds with the kind of MFA thing of, of write what you know. But one of the things that's really striking about these books is that they're really writing way beyond what they know. You know, th these are these are these are books that are that are based and rooted in particular experiences. But um, you know, but but Sarah is, is writing about um, a 74-year-old woman, and it's very much. I mean, I, this is a book that I've sold, and I and I've spoke with people who have bought it and read it, and it's and it's fascinating to have these conversations about you know like what it means to. Uh, you know, to, to write about and occupy someone outside of your own of your own experience, um, and so I want to I want to just present that question to each of you how you um, how you find ways to to inhabit a, a, a kind of life and a kind of life experience that is is beyond something you've personally experienced, and and especially if you could talk about it in terms of your own of your own writing, like uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask Sarah to start. Uh, well, in terms of how I inhabit uh, the life of a 74-year-old, when, when my book was announced as the book to be read in Nigeria, uh, the Nigerian journalist, bless them, said, and the author is born in the 1930s. So I think, <laughs> so I look pretty good for my age. So I think there's a little confusion <laughs> with the character that I've written about in my, second, uh, in my second book. But, you know, Aaron, I wanted to go back to you um, what you said about it's hard to sort of find something between the three of us that sort of will sort of is similar because there's, there's so much variety. I, I actually think something that's very similar between the three of us is, and obviously you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but is the influence of the oral tradition on all of our writing. Um, and I know you both... Uh, thank your families for the stories that they told you. You know, I've listened to you talk about your work. Um, that oral tradition, oral tradition was very important, uh, Jennifer, as you were writing um, historical fiction. Yes. And I think your father's also been quite an influence. And, um, you know, I grew up, I'm the daughter of an Anglican minister. Uh, so I grew up listening to him telling stories mainly about his children, so I get back at him now telling stories about him. Um, <laughs> but I also grew up my, my, on my mother's side, Yorkshire, Northern England, that storytelling as well. So I think that oral tradition and, and hearing the sound of stories is really important. I think and in my reading of both of you, it's important to you as well. Um, I don't know if there's time and if people want to read a little bit, but I think you, you, you know, you'll get a sense of that from reading or if, at some other point if you have time to hear people read their work. Um, so, yeah, so now I've promptly forgotten your question as well, but I, I do think that the sound of the stories, very different sounds, um, is something that's, that unites us in, in, even though it's, it's a different sound. So. Mm -hmm. I would yes, agree. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, yes, I, yeah, and I think that yeah, that sort of um, you know the, the auditory quality of of, uh, of of the work, and I you know I especially noticed this in, in Jennifer's book, the uh, you know the sort of the the internal rhythm of the sentences, right, where 
where they work, they, they work you know, as the text being read out loud, but if it was just a sound, right, you could, you, there's still, like, there's, there's a certain sort of um, uh, musicality to it, but also, like, patterns. There's, there's, there are patterns to, to, to the work. And so, yes, I do think that, that um, the oral quality has definitely um, uh, influenced um, our work. Yeah, yeah. But to um, Aaron, Aaron's question um, about sort of inhabiting, um, you know, the different, you know, you know, these characters are with, with different stories, different um, perspectives than, than um, us as the writers have. Um, for me, it's a matter of, um, it's a matter of, uh, you know, without, without sounding very, like, you know, wooey and, like, you know, um, but, you know, the, the idea that, that you have to, you become them, or you, or you see, you, you it's sort of, uh, creative empathy where you even though they're not you and they don't they might not be making the same decisions that you would you still um, you still identify with them you still see them so clearly you understand them so fully that you're able to you know represent their thoughts and their you know their um, their um, you know inner inner life on the page just like sort of and this is like the craft answer to that is what you know just you know a creative empathy right and so um, yeah yeah um, the thing about us writers is that um, I think we grew up with a, a mad kind of imagination and creativity. I mean, I was the kind of child who watched an aunt walking on, you know, on the ground and I th okay, that, there is a mother, she's left her children behind and she's going to bring food. If you walk over her, if you crush her, the children are going to starve, you know. So that aunt, even though I just saw it there and I've never been an aunt, I could imagine it's life, you know. So for me, when it came to writing um, Buganda Kingdom in the 1700s, you know, it, it was imagination and it was creativity on top of research. But it was also oral traditions because uh, in conversation, in sayings, in myth, in all those forms of oral traditions that are still being passed on to us by uh, the other generation, which are also being generated because there's a belief that oral traditions ended mm -hmm. and now we've moved into the writing. But actually oral traditions are being generated on the street. Mm -hmm. it, they, it, they come from the street and it's very, very interesting. So it's those that, you know, Again, it's the rhythm, it's what people say, it's what you hear, it's the, the dreams. It's a, so it, they help you to inhabit a world that is not yours. But it's mainly creativity and imagination. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder, it, it, it occurred to me actually, I was thinking of, now, now I'm trying to like put these three books together, and I, I wonder if there's a way that you're all, in different ways, um, having a very intense conversation with religion, among other things. Um, but I, I wonder if, there, if, if I could ask you to talk about that, you know, and, and to talk about the ways that um, both engage with, with religion, received religion, and also a sense of the spiritual world and a sense of, um, of things that are that are beyond rational understanding. Um, I, I mean, this is particularly a question I want to hear Jennifer answer. But, but uh... yes, um, at the moment in Africa, Christianity is African. Um, you know, it it was brought like a hundred years ago, but we've made it African. And in Britain, you wouldn't be surprised. And I laugh on this when I walk on the street and I find Africans are preaching to the British. And you're like, okay, uh, this is ridiculous because they brought Christianity to us. But now it is African. And if you look at how, Afri uh, how Christianity is practiced in Africa, it's been Africanized, mm -hmm. you know, dancing, clapping, you know, it's no longer the piano singing and, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's so African. But it, it has such, had such a, a tremendous impact mm -hmm. on culture. Um, especially uh, for someone from Uganda, 
I, when I was doing my research for Chain 2, I found out that actually, for example, homosexuality was rampant in Uganda before the arrival of Christianity. You know, uh, in fact, m uh, gay, no, I can't call them gay people, homosexuality among men was seen as hyper masculinity, you know. But then the Christians arrived and they said, this is such a sin, oh my God, horrible, horrible. And we Ugandans, we are so, so sad and so ashamed. And in fact, one of our kings who was a, a, a homosexual was ousted and exiled. Now, 50 years later, the British and the Americans are arriving impatient, you know, homophobia. And you're like, hang on a minute, guys. You know, this, this is what you brought to us. You know, you know, so this is the thing about Christianity, you know. And as a writer, you cannot, there's no way you can write an African novel and not engage with religion because you grow up with it, you eat it, you live, you feel it. And, and you can see the good side of it and you can see the destructive side of it and there's no way you cannot engage with it. Um, I, I grew up the parents of, of pastors. My, my, um, my, in fact, my, my mother was, was, the, was the pastor and, and so um, I, I, so my, my relationship with religion and, and the religion that we practiced, we were, we were first Catholic and then we converted to uh, non-denominational evangelical Christian, Christianity. And, you know, so I, like, like though that's sort of, you know, I, I, I can describe it as, as such now. That was the cage, right, that was, that was, um, that, uh, that, we grew up in, and, and I say a cage because like there were you know there's so many rules to to this um, to this particular um, to like the way sort of radical evangelical Christianity is, is structured, right? Um, and so I think I feel like you know so even though I don't directly address religion, yes, it would be you know it, it's it's something that I write about, right? I um, I uh, you know. I push back, I think, on, uh, I, I push back on, on the idea that there, like, this is, like, whenever someone says this is the way things are and the way, this is how you're supposed to do it, like, my, my initial instinct is just to push back on that, to question, right? Um, and I think that, uh, I think that um, something that happens when you grow up in, you know, this, like, you know, a very spiritual household, and you know, spiritual, you know, being separate from evangelical Christian, Christian. So the two of them coming together, you know, the particular African way, the particular particular way of Africanized um, Christianity is, um, you know, relating to the work. It's the idea that you know, people talk magical realism versus realism, et cetera, et cetera. It's like your whole world is magical realism if you grow up <laughs> in, in this, you know. It's like, you know, it's, you know, there are, um, you know, you, there, we believe, believe, people believe in angels and demons warring over your soul as you're sitting in this chair. So it's like, you know, it's the idea that, uh, and so like, I, I feel like I, um, I write with, with sort of this expanded, uh, view of the world that considers the, the you know the spiritual plane as well as the physical, um, and uh, and and I mean it's something that I, I want to eventually write you know directly. I can be looking because right now I'm sort of like you know off center. It's not quite, and I'm writing about it, but not writing to it. And I do want to write to it eventually, but um, I think that a lot of my work sort of walks around that that area. I think it's very interesting to hear what both of you have to say. I think for me, religion and matters of faith, uh, there's several layers of it for me. Um, I, I, I made reference to this earlier that my father's an Anglican minister, and so I, I, I've always been interested in preaching, um, you know, and I should also say I grew up in the north of Nigeria, so I, I grew up in the church, but I also grew up breaking the fast at Ramadan now uh, with Muslim friends, neighbors, um, 
we had, we had very close Jewish friends, and my grandparents are atheists. So I grew up around people of different faiths. So that's always been, um, you know, some, you know, all of that has influenced me. But the power of storytelling, you know, seeing my father tell sermons, thinking about people that I admire or that I've thought about, uh, coming to America, thinking of, you know, Martin Luther King and his tradition of speaking and the rhythm and the language, even someone like James Baldwin, whose father I think was a pastor. Um, so I'm really interested in, in, in religion in that sense, in terms of following how people preach and the stories that they tell. Um, I'm also interested in religion globally, um, this whole prosperity doctrine, particularly in, in Christianity. And um, uh, this, is, it, this is something that personally concerns me that I see in Nigeria. I see my husband is, in, is from Zimbabwe, so I, I spend a lot of, well, I spent quite a bit of time in Zimbabwe as well. And in the States, this, I, I'm really interested in the intersection between religious faith and where we are as a world and issues of inequality and poverty and what role the church plays can play in that for good, um, but also how it can be exploited. Um, and so this is something that I've written about a little bit in um, nonfiction. But I think maybe another layer of um, uh, how sort of religion and faith come into my own work, um, particularly with this last book, um, this book is exploring the life of a woman who's close to 75, and um, you know she's thinking more about the end of life. And so I think, um, you know, what, what happens after we die? Is there anything else? Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Um, you know, thinking about mortality. Um, and so certainly thinking about religion and faith and spirituality um, play into my work in subtle ways, I think, on that level. Um, I think we, we have time to, to, to take questions. Um, and I would like to invite that hand. Um, a couple pages will take up a, maybe, are, are there, are there some very short passages? <laughs> or or would, 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 you, would you rather just no, take questions? Yeah, just take questions. Okay. Um, if we limit it to like three or four minutes, what, what time is it? I don't know. We, I have, don't know. we have about 25 minutes. 25 minutes? 25 minutes? No. It's up no. to you all if you want no. to hear a little bit or if you want yes. to have more. Yes, yes, yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe you could read a quick passage and then we could move to questions. Sorry, what's Aaron saying? Do you want us all to? No, we, uh, we like you. We, we delegate. You delegate. Okay. We read the opening paragraph. Okay. Ah, okay. That sounds good. It's a compromise. Go ahead, okay. There was a knock. Chintu's woman woke up and climbed over him to get the doll. She picked a kanga off the floor and wrapped it around her naked body. Sucking her teeth at being disturbed so early in the morning, she walked to the door with the annoyance of a proper wife whose w husband was at home. <laughs> okay. uh, the future looks good. As Inma fumbles the keys against the lock and doesn't see what came behind her, her father as a boy when he was still tender, vying for his mother's affection, her grandmother, Overworked to the bone by the women whose houses she dusted, whose laundry she washed, whose children's asses she scrubbed clean. Overworked by the bones of a husband who wanted many sons and the men she entertained to give them to him. Sees her son to his 13th year with the perfunction of a nurse and dies in her bed with a long, weary sigh. Uh, so this is Mariah De Silva, and she lives in San Francisco. The place where I live is ancient, old but sturdy. That's what my landlady says. 500 Belgrave is so strong, apparently, that it withstood the 1906 earthquake. Didn't even bust a single crack. 
That's what the landlady says. But between you and me, I wouldn't bet on history repeating itself. <laughs> it's the reason why I live on the top floor. For if this building collapses, then, well, at least they won't have far to dig me out. <laughs> of course, I don't wish any harm to any of my neighbors, especially not to the gentleman living just beneath me. As for the sullen woman on the ground floor, <clears throat> who insists on calling me Mary because she finds Morayo too hard to pronounce, that's just another story. But I wish even her no harm. I'd like to imagine that when the big one strikes, we'd all be gathered at my place, enjoying a glass of Sauvignon Blanc, and we'd ride the whole thing out and live to tell the tale. But who knows? When the earth finally decides that it's tired of fidgeting and it needs a proper stretch, I might be the one walking downstairs. And if that's the case, well, the only survivors will be my books, hundreds of them, to keep each other company. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we can, we can take questions now. Yeah. Um, can I grab one of the wireless mics and just to share? Sure. Yes. I'll speak to that as women writing from Africa. Does that make sense? Yes. It's very broad, I know. Do you want to go? Okay, I'll go for it. Um, you're absolutely, absolutely right. This could be a panel of African women's writing. Uh, fortunately, the books we've written are not particularly about African women, women's writing, but there is, it's incredible, the amount of African women writers that there is. Sometimes we go to a, a conference and men are complaining, where are the men writers? <laughs> you know. <laughs> In the past, it used to be all the men and people, the audience would ask, where are the women? Now, we don't know what happened In between the 70s, we know, um, there were those early women writers who started the movement, like Amat Haido, you know. There were, you know, they sort of cut the, the bush away and paved way for African women writers. But I'm sure they were not prepared for what is happening at the moment. So many African women writers are coming up. But having said that, I have taught at a university in Britain, creative writing, and it's the same in the West. You have 12 students who are creative writing students, but 10 are girls and two are boys. So it's not only happening in Africa. I just want to add, let me, let me just big up some men here. Uh, so there's a fantastic new prize in, that comes out of uh, Nigeria. It's not that new, actually. It's going into its fifth year. It's called the Etisola Prize for Literature. And Jennifer's work was long listed in, I think, the inaugural year uh, for that prize. And the last couple winners, most of the shortlisted writers have been women. But, um, and the first winner of the whole prize was a woman, no Violet Bulawayo, but... In the last couple of years, the prize winner has been a man. So there's a guy called Songeziwe Malangu, who comes from Southern Africa, South Africa. Um, uh, Joho Ile won it this year. And then um, the author of Tram... 83. Oh, uh, Tram 89. 
Tram 83. I can't yes. remember his name. Yeah. Um, so, but I mention this also just to say that there's a lot happening within the continent mm -hmm. that people may not be aware of outside the continent, yeah. and that's absolutely fine. Uh, but if you want to be really hip and if you want to be really au courant with what's happening, then um, one thing you can do is you can check out the Etta Slap Prize for Literature. I am a patron, of course, so I am, of course, publicizing it, but um, I would have done this anyway, whether I'm associated with it or not, because it's really exciting in terms of the voices that it's lifting up. So it's, it's it, and one of the reasons it's exciting is because it's sponsored. It's the first time that a major prize coming out of Africa for African writers is sponsored by a African corporation. It's Etisalat, which is a telecommunications company, E-T-I-S, I'm the world's worst speller, E-T-I-S. Thank you, A L A T. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, yes, so you can check out um, who have been the long-listed writers, shortlisted, and so forth, and get some get some new names. Well, I, I guess it was Jennifer who was talking about how the editors might westernize your language, but obviously you're all writing in English, or we wouldn't be reading it to yes. a certain degree. <laughs> yes. So, so a lot of ways your language kind of, uh, you have a compromise that you're having to make about presenting Africa in a voice that is somewhat westernized already to a certain degree and not lose that authenticity that you want so that your literature, as you were talking about it, is still accepted within Africa as really feeling African and feeling, uh, capturing the emotions of the people in, in that regard. And then the other side of it is, I was talking with my friend, and, and he grew up reading French literature out of Africa. And so if, if you can speak to sort of those influences, if you have them as well, for, for your understanding of African literature. So thanks. Um, OK. With, um, when I talked about African literature being edited by Western editors, it, it's, it's just like you have British English, you have American English, and you have Australian English. We have Ugandan English. Have Nigerian you English. You have Nigerian English. Actually, we call it Uglish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and when I read a Nigerian book, I don't have to know the writer to know that this is from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. We all, th this is the good thing about English. That it, it, you know, we have made it our own. That's what Achebe said. He said, okay, this language was brought to me as an act of violence, but I'm going to make it my own. And that's what we're doing. So when I bring a, a book that is written in Ugandan English, and I give it to a Brit, and it starts to go, oh, this is wrong. Oh, look at the prepositions. So one mm -hmm. of the prepositions we argued over was, we live on a village. The editor was insisting you live in a village. No, we live on a village, you know. So the, 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 those are some of the things that, you know, uh, b make the language sound Ugandan because there's a way we speak it mm -hmm. back home. And that is what we don't want to be killed by a, a very keen editor. Yes, um, stand up. Yes, I'd like to first um, thank Sarah for making a 74-year-old woman your central character. <laughs> <laughs> I just really appreciate and I have to confess I, I look forward to reading your books also. And I'm just wondering, I'm a little curious that you don't acknowledge some of the, what I, from my small amount of knowledge, know for mothers such as Buchi Emiketa, Bessie Head, yes. Nadine Gordimer, when you talk about African authors being predominantly men. I mean, we can't, even though it's true, we have to at least add the but. Yeah. Yes. Should I go? No, yes, no, thank you for highlighting um, the, those women authors, um, yes, and that was an omission. Uh, I think I was the person that listed the, the male authors that are well known. Um, and yeah, and I, I think, you know, f for me, you know, 
Virginia Woolf. There are a whole bunch of other, other older or writers who have passed who have also influenced me. So, and for all of us, I think, you know, Jennifer mentioned Shakespeare. I think um, we, we draw from a rich, a rich heritage. Um, I wanted to say one more thing on the language thing, which is just to underline that English is an African language right now. Um, yeah. And one of the things that really excites me about um, books that are coming out now is I feel that we're teaching the world new strains of English. Mm -hmm. um, one of the phrases from Nigeria that I used recently in an in a essay that I wrote is this phrase, shine your eyes, mm -hmm. which means, you know, and particularly in the political situation we are in at the moment, globally, what's going on? What's really going on? What are the issues here? Are we looking at inequalities? Are we looking at poverty, et cetera? And I just love you know, the notion of shine your eyes. And that, that's a phrase that you'll hear in Nigerian. You know, I'm sure whatever has, has come into Nigerian pigeon by now. Um, <laughs> you know, th so there's such experimentation, fun, you know, with the way that language is used, reworked reshaped um, that's always really exciting. So I think a lot happens that's exciting linguistically with English um, in the continent and beyond. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? There's a, there's one in the back. Are the books that have been significantly edited for Western writers going to be reissued for at, as original manuscripts, I mean, using the original manuscripts without the additions? Which books? Well, you were talking earlier about how so many of the, the books that are coming, that have come out of Africa, oh. have been significantly edited for Western writers. Mm -hmm. Are the original manuscripts going to be published for Western readers without the additions? I, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I like that, that would be up to whoever the writer is. And the, the, but it's, and the publisher. Right. And I, and I, I think that, I mean, I feel like that, that chip has, has sailed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, that, you know, now it's, you know, it's a matter of, like, you know, we were talking, you know, we're talking about that sort of contrast, how that's not a thing that's happening now. And so I don't know about going back, uh, you know, 23 years and digging up uh, an old manuscript that from a publisher from that long and republishing it. I, I, I don't think that's, I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, but also, um, those books are read and told like that because they come from a time. So right. they represent a time that is interesting to many African readers. Uh, if you're talking about how books were edited in this way. You know, those books are still being published and they are being read like that. So it's just a question of trend. So maybe poetry in the past, when you read a poem, or every line started with capitalization. But now, if you publish a poem like that, everybody's like, what are you doing? However, people who, poems that were written like that are still being taught and we read them knowing which time they came from. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they are in danger of not being read, but they are there as a marker of a certain generation of African writer. I, I, think, I think the biggest issue in all of this is for writers not to feel the burden of having to explain things. Mm -hmm. um, when you have to explain things, it does things to your language. It burdens it, it pulls it down. You know, that freshness, that that your own unique voice doesn't have that uh, way of coming out as easily and as naturally, perhaps. And I, th I think, so I think that's the bigger, the bigger issue. Um, again, I've mentioned I've been thinking a lot about Toni Morrison, and you know, when Toni Morrison says, I write to, for, and about African Americans, she, that's what she does. And her language is not mediated or held back or, you know, in any shape or form. And in fact, actually, when we were talking about religion, I was thinking about a line in Beloved that I love so much. It's actually a scene. And it's where she describes the character of Stamp Paid going to pick berries for um, Setha shortly after Setha gives birth and is fleeing uh, into freedom. And th the berries are described as... Um, 
berries as sweet as church. Um, and for me, you know, you have to understand something about African American history and the role of, the ch of church and faith um, in times of slavery and so forth to really get mm -hmm. the power of those words. And you know, I think Tony, I don't want to speak for her, but but let me try and speak for her. We'll say, I, I don't really care if people don't, that everyone doesn't get all the nuances. I know that my audience, me, gets all of those those nuances, and I think. You know, rather than for her to try and explain what she means uh, with that particular phrase. So I think the same thing goes for all of us and, and writers coming, coming from different cultures and so forth, not having to worry about, well, will everyone get it? Well, no one ever gets everything. Mm -hmm. um, and just having that freedom to know that it's okay. Um, and that's kind of the beauty of writing. They're, they're, they're little things in each of our books that we know that not everyone's going to get. We yeah. know that there'll be one or two people who get most of the illusions and so forth, and that's okay. Um, yeah. 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 It, it, frees, it frees us as writers to sort of talk to the page in our own cultural shorthand. And, that, and then that is, that's, an important, that's important because it's, you know, it's the way that you default towards expressing yourself. And so, yeah. And language, you know, reading, it's not just the words, it's the rhythm. It's the tone. Um, I have a few Ugandan words in my book, but you don't need to know what they're saying because you'll get the context, you know. You spoke very eloquently about the influence of religion in your writing and the examination in your writing of religion. I wonder if the terrible history of colonialism also is somehow running as a theme through the work that you do. Um, and if you had any thoughts about that or, um, and failing that, if you would speak a little bit about maybe some of your own personal influences, uh, write other writers that you um, feel your work emerges from, I'd be curious about that too. Thank you. Okay. Um, because I've taught um, literature at university level, and I was quite aware that you know a lot of writing out of Africa was either pre-colonial, colonial, or post-colonial. Um, it sort of took away anything else that is African. And African literature was just colonial, post-colonial, colonial, you know. And like, you know, there had never been anything else apart from colonization, you know. And also, when we write books that are about colonization, for some reason, readers in the West focus on the act of Europe in Africa. And in a way, we periphrase our own experiences because, you know, attention is taken away from what is going on within African lives. And we focus more on what Europe is doing to Africans. Again, you're just focusing on Europe. So in Chintu, I just cut colonialism. I, it was intentional. I cut that part because it's from 1700s. I cut colonization out. And also I was reacting to Hegel's statement that Africa had no history before the arrival of Europe. And oh my God. Um, so no, I was not going to have colonization. You can go to Chinwachebe and Nguji if you were looking for colonization. Because you know Africa is bigger, bigger than colonization. So I had Africa before Europe arrived. And I have in my novel, Africa, after Europe leaves. So it was intentional. Um, there were, I think there was another part of the question about um, uh, Influence, religions. And, uh, yes, so I mean, I, uh, you know, well, most of my, you know, most of my, um, my short stories, uh, you know, with the exception of those that take place in sort of like um, eph ephemeris fable-like environments, most of them are they're contemporary. And so I feel like there is, uh, I, I feel like sometimes I feel like I need to, I need to remind people like, 
Like there are Africans still in Africa who like who are living in the contemporary world. Like we are we we exist, um, and and so um, and so you know, uh, a twenty a twenty two year old African woman, you know, the Nigerian twenty two year old Nigerian woman today, even though um, obviously you know colonialism has has affected the trajectory of her history of her you know of her, her family, but it's not like she's not sitting in her room texting her friends about oh, this post-colonial life. Like you're not, you know, <laughs> it's not a thing that's happening. And so it's like, I mean, so, so it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, it's like the ghost. It's a ghost in the background, but we're writing about the people who are alive. It's actually interesting as we're talking, I'm just wondering how many American writers were asked about their colonial experience in the last century? <laughs> um, but um, in, in response to that, my, I mean, my first book, Independence, t as two words, was about the period that I felt hadn't been written about that I really wanted to write, read more about, which was what happened in that period in the 1960s when Africans from different parts of the continent left the continent, came to America, came to England, and were absolutely certain, and this is my father's generation, of returning to Africa, and Africa was going to lead the world. So, and that was just, it was a really exciting, phenomenal time, and I hadn't read stories in that period, so that's when I set, um, you know, that particular book. Um, in terms of influences there, I, I could just, I mean, so, so many influences for me. Um, oral storytelling continues to be a huge influence, um, you know, you know, walking around the corner, hearing people telling stories, eavesdropping, you know, I listen, listen, listen. This is why I can't work in anywhere else but a room that has no distraction. Um, so, but, you know, you've heard me talk about Toni Morrison, Motion Hamid is someone I've been reading, a mm. contemporary writer. Uh, I like his short books that you can read in a day, and that's sort of influenced this last book that I've written that is shorter. Um, I'm really excited, really excited, not just because I'm on the panel, but by you know, Jennifer, when I, when I read the beginning of Jennifer's book, I do this occasionally. I did this with Jennifer's book. I did this with Vanda Levita's book, the last book she wrote at the very end. At the beginning of Jennifer's book, I stood up and I clapped. And I clapped because <laughs> I'm like, this is a voice I've been waiting to hear and I have not heard this voice. And there's another writer, um, Yemisi Ari Basala, who's written a book called Long Throat Memoirs. She writes like Nina Simone sings. And I just was like, yes, this is so exciting. And the same thing with Leslie. I think I read your first story in The New Yorker. And um, wow, I mean, that just is like... You know, they inspire me so to, and this is what's so exciting about this particular era, that I have contemporaries, um, people younger than me that are writing these things that just make me think, oh, I just love this and I wanna, I wanna write like them, so yeah. Could you say the name again? Yemisi, <laughs> Y-E-M-I-S-I, Ari Bisala, A-R-I, oh, Ari. B I S A L A. But anyway, there's no other book called Long Throat Memoirs, yeah. Sex, Soup, Soup, Sex. Of course, the sex came first. Soup, Sex, and the Nigerian Taste Buds. Yeah. And it's just like, oh. it's not available yet in the States. It will be shortly, although you can get it online. Um, but it's so exciting. She's writing about, uh, you know, cuisine from Nigeria, and she's writing about she has a way of infusing history and culture and global cuisine and it's funny and it's, it's badass. It's just, you know. We are, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, I wanna thank everyone for coming. I wanna thank Transit Books. And I wanna thank our panels particularly.